Now, I thought I'd start off today by uh, telling you the uh, story of a couple of meetings I've attended recently because there's some very interesting things that have come up, generally speaking, in the field of regenerative medicine. Uh, and then we'll sort of take that and apply that to, uh, to spinal cord injury uh, specifically. About a month or so ago, uh, Mike Milken hosted a, an event in Washington through his Faster Cures group, which is an organization I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but for those who aren't, uh, it's a, a basically a, a large networking organization that is designed to facilitate the spread of uh, scientific knowledge to accelerate medical research. And as you know, uh, there's a lot of talk back in Washington these days about cutting funding for everything. Uh, sequestration uh, is sort of looming at the end of the year, which promises, if enacted, to dramatically cut back funds across the board, but as pertains to this audience, uh, specifically uh, cut back funds at NIH uh, in a very draconian manner. I believe it's 8%, which is, uh, it would be a, a very big deal. So Milken wanted to organize Faster Cures to put on an event in, uh, in Washington in Congress's doorstep to talk about how great science is and how great biology is and the contribution that it's made to the world, basically. And he called this event a celebration of science. There were about a thousand people there. Uh, it was a three-day event. And it was uh, really quite remarkable. Uh, it pulled together all the leaders of government interested in healthcare. Uh, it had uh, university presidents, it had patient advocates, it had uh, philanthropists interested in health care, uh, it had the last four or five heads of NIH, the last four or five heads of the FDA, uh, all coming together to celebrate science. Uh, the middle day of this event was at NIH. Uh, it featured uh, a, a host of speakers talking about what NIH is doing, uh, and, and the director, Francis Collins, uh, going around the NIH campus be, and interviewing folks who are doing cutting-edge work on the campus and beaming it in real time to the auditorium where everybody was assembled. Uh, and you heard about all sorts of stuff that's going on. A lot of it emphasized work that the Defense Department has commissioned, uh, and a lot of that had to do with spinal cord uh, uh, injury, uh, as well as a lot of other things, uh, lost limbs, uh, and, and regeneration of uh, the nervous system, uh, uh, regeneration of limbs, et cetera. Very interesting. But the, the, the thing that, that was sort of most striking to me, when you hear about the term regenerative medicine, you hear about uh, sort of a couple things. One is stem cell research, uh, which of course we're directly involved in. Uh, the other is genomics, which is the, the sequencing of uh, everybody's DNA. Uh, and the two combine and sort of form what is going to be uh, the basis for uh, a trend in medicine that is coming, and that is what they call personalized medicine, where they tailor make the treatment of an individual to his particular set of facts, or his or her particular set of facts. And on the theme of, of uh, personalized medicine, and uh, this is, uh, is not per se um, something that is a stem cell story. It's really a genomic story, but it was s such an interesting story I wanted to relay it to you because I think it's indicative of what's to come in all fields, including the treatment of spinal cord injury. So there's a family uh, in San Diego called the Berry family. Uh, the Berry family about 16 years ago had twins, a boy and a girl, and at age two, uh, these both twins were diagnosed with cerebral palsy. And they showed pictures uh, of the kids. 
And from the way they, they held themselves and the way they walked, uh, posture and their limbs and everything else, uh, these kids looked like they had cerebral palsy. The mother observed that that was all well and good, not good, but she accepted it, but she noticed that the condition of the children deteriorated over the course of each day, which is not something that's characteristic of cerebral palsy. So she didn't take that diagnosis for an answer. She went and she combed the internet relentlessly, looking for any information that might bear on what she was observing in her children. And lo and behold, she came across an article uh, from the LA Times from several years earlier, which talked about a condition called dopa responsive dystopia that mimics cerebral palsy. Uh, and she th said, I wonder if this is what our kids have. So she talked to the doctor, and the doctor said, well, it's, it's certainly worth uh, a shot because dopa responsive dystopia is the name suggests uh, is uh, something that can be treated with L-DOPA, which is one of the principal treatments for Parkinson's disease. And they gave these kids the drug, and the kids suddenly completely reversed their symptoms and became totally normal two-year-olds, which was remarkable. Now, I, I, I'm describing the story as it, it was actually told by the parents standing on the stage at NIH, uh, very dramatic presentation. So these kids go on and they show clips of them at seven, eight, nine, ten, and they're off rock climbing and riding bikes and they're totally fine. And then they get to about 12 years old and they start having trouble again. And not with the same symptoms that they had before, but with other symptoms, tremors, uh, considerable difficulty breathing, several other things that were really debilitating and causing these kids a lot of trouble. So again, the mom goes on the internet and is trying to find anything because the doctors can't figure out what's going on here. The research she does online ultimately turns up a doctor at Baylor University who is the head of their genomics institute. She calls, this is Dr. Richard Gibbs is his name, she calls Dr. Gibbs, describes what's going on and takes the children. He does a full genome sequencing of the kids and it turns out that because of the ability to do this sequencing, they were able to tell that these kids had a mutation uh, that uh, was something that uh, caused uh, a deficiency of serotonin in their bodies. Uh, and uh, that if you treated that with something that would replenish the serotonin, uh, perhaps that would help. And they gave these kids the treatment, and sure enough, the kids lost all of those symptoms again. And today, our top track athletes in high school in San Diego, uh, and it, at the point when they're telling this, the crowd is just sort of sitting there listening, sort of riveted to this, and right when they talk about how the kids are now, the kids come bounding onto the stage. It's very dramatic. But the point of all this is that the ability to sequence the human genome, part of regenerative medicine, led to a personalized medical treatment that allowed these kids to uh, get back to living normal lives. And that's something that I think you're going to see down the road uh, as a coming trend, which we are very excited about. So that's the first story I wanted to tell. Second story comes from a conference that we had, CIRM sponsored along with Oz. I'd like to introduce Oz Stewart, a member of our board of CIRM and well known in the Irvine community and has done terrific work in the area of spinal cord injury, among other things, Oz, welcome. I just told them the story, Oz, Oz was with me in Washington, of the, the Berry kids and personalized medicine and the genomics analysis. 
So the second story comes from uh, this meeting we held down in San Diego, which we call the Meeting on the Mesa. And the Meeting on the Mesa is uh, an aggregation of companies that are involved in stem cell research uh, and have a variety of products that they are working on. And this is a very interesting event. It's an annual event. And, the, and these companies come, and among other things, they present in 15-minute increments very condensed and concise descriptions of what it is they are working on. There were a number of very interesting presentations. Uh, certainly one of the most interesting was the Stem Cells, Inc. Uh, presentation, which uh, you'll be hearing, uh, you, you well know about, but we'll be hearing more about uh, here uh, right after I speak. Uh, but there were other sorts of uh, company presentations that, that bear directly on the area of spinal cord injury. Uh, there's a company called Rhinocyte. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. This is something that uh, plans to submit for uh, approval from the FDA uh, this quarter to start human clinical trials. Uh, there were a number of companies that are working on remyelinating uh, the, the nerves where you've had degeneration or, uh, uh, or other problems with the, 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 the nervous system and which preclude being able to conduct uh, the, the electrical signals through the nerves that allow for proper movement. Uh, a number of, of companies that are, are making real progress. And it's very interesting to hear because we know that things are happening out there. We know that, uh, that we have funded a tremendous amount of research, as have others. You don't always hear about it in the press, about what's going on, because the press, I can say, frequently tends to focus on sort of bureaucratic issues or uh, ethical issues or whatever uh, in stem cell research. They don't always focus on exactly what's happening and what the progress is that's being made, which is considerable. Uh, we are very happy to uh, be a source of funding through the generosity of the taxpayers of California for stem cell research in the state. Uh, Prop 71, which you know uh, about, uh, uh, passed now eight years ago. 57% of the state population voted to approve what is really a paradigm shift in the treatment uh, or in the research, uh, uh, research efforts in all sorts of types of, of medicine. Uh, it was a, uh, a grand experiment, which I'm happy to report to you, is uh, producing tremendous results. Uh, Prop 71, as you know, gave us uh, $3 billion to fund research to academic institutions and companies in the state of California doing stem cell research. And what that has done, because that is a very significant amount of money and more money for stem cell research than any place else in the world has to, uh, to administer, uh, it has turned California really into the epicenter of stem cell research in the country. Uh, and this is, uh, is, is evidenced in uh, numerous ways, uh, one of which is we have a continuing stream of senior stem cell scientists from around the world moving to California just to have the opportunity to apply to CIRM for funding. Uh, last count, I think we're up to 135, give or take. They all bring in their, uh, th their staffs, their postdocs. Uh, there's a, a great multiplier effect on, on, the, uh, on, on the, the scientific community in this area. And what you see when I go up and down the state, when Oz does, Manny does, et cetera, we hear that because we have this, this tremendous pool of talent, both uh, indigenous and from the outside, uh, we are, uh, are able to, to dramatically see 
a, a tremendous acceleration in the pace of medical research. Uh, to date, we have funded uh, almost 1.8 Oz, is that about right? 1.8 billion of our three. Uh, we have research going on in 38 currently incurable diseases or conditions, uh, ranging from uh, the most prevalent problems uh, of the day, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, spinal cord injury, uh, other neurodegenerative diseases, uh, all the way down, and we have a lot of work going on in the vision space, uh, all the way down to rarer or so-called orphan diseases, which may affect uh, fewer people, but are nonetheless devastating and, and, uh, and requiring of, of great attention to try to develop therapies or cures. And actually what we're about really uh, is we uh, are aiming very high. We are looking for cures. Uh, this is something that was uh, made clear to the public when Prop 71 was passed. Uh, it's something that obviously isn't going to happen overnight. Uh, one of the problems we have with the press, which I'm sure you've read about, is the press will say, gee, we authorized three billion dollars. You've been putting money out. We haven't heard of any cures. You were supposed to have cures in a month, in two weeks, in whatever. Well, it doesn't quite happen that way. Science moves at a certain pace. Uh, it goes in sort of fits and starts, uh, but we have been able, as I say, to greatly accelerate that pace by bringing together a collection of unparalleled scientific talent in the state to deal with these issues. Now, I, I tell the story when I sit down with reporters who are, uh, are a, a little intimidated by trying to figure out what it is we actually do, because the science while not rocket science, is nonetheless esoteric, just like things that, <coughs> excuse me, that, that you folks all do. You have your own particular specialties, and if you're not in that specialty, it's kind of, you feel it's a little tough to, to learn. Uh, so I sit down with these, these, uh, these folks, and, and they're telling me how we don't have any cures and why is that, and I said, look, I said, I will bet you, Mr fill in the blank newspaper reporter that 60 years ago your grandfather was sitting down at a table interviewing Jonas Salk, 1954, and said to Jonas Salk, you know, March of Dimes started raising money for polio research in 1938, and they've co collected to date umpteen million dollars, it's been going down the hole, you got nothing to show for it, what's your problem? Well, 1955 rolls along and all of a sudden we have the Salk polio vaccine, which by any estimates has saved probably hundreds of millions of people worldwide from that particular scourge. So it took 17 years to get from the beginning of serious fundraising for research to an actual vaccine that effectively has eliminated polio, with some exception, from most corners of the world. That's the magnitude of the work that uh, we believe our scientists are undertaking. We are going after big game. We are going after cures. Uh, it's something that is going to take a while. But we believe, I think if you ask anybody involved in CIRM, that it's going to be something that is going to produce dramatic results. One of the areas, of course, we're very attuned to and looking to generate dramatic results in is the area of spinal cord injury. Uh, to date, we funded about 38 to 40 million uh, in that field, uh, starting from basic research all the way up through our recent award to Stem Cells Inc. for the excellent spinal cord work that they are doing. Uh, we had funded uh, the research that Geron was undertaking. Uh, we had 25 million that we gave to them. 
Uh, we, along with the rest of, of this community, were uh, extremely disappointed when they chose to uh, back away from the research that they had uh, and the clinical trials that they had started. Uh, we first and foremost felt very badly for, uh, very badly for the patients who had pinned so much hope on that. Uh, and uh, and uh, I will say, are watching with great interest, as you are, I'm sure, the offer to buy the stem cell part of Geron's portfolio that has been put on the table by, uh, interestingly enough, uh, a team of two former CEOs of Geron, uh, Mike West and Tom O'Karma, who uh, believe in the, uh, the spinal cord uh, research and clinical trials that were going on. And that's something that everybody's watching very carefully because we would like nothing more than to see that uh, clinical trial work uh, resume. Uh, I had occasion to, as you, you know, I think, there were six patients uh, that Geron had treated uh, before they decided to uh, focus more on uh, cancer therapies that they had in the pipeline. Y you know their CEO changed and he was a cancer guy uh, and, and that was something he was more comfortable with and for business uh, purposes they decided to focus more on that. But these, these, of the six people that were actually treated with the cells, uh, as you know, the, they were in phase one, and they uh, have, have all gone through and are being carefully monitored. Uh, phase one in an FDA trial is all about safety and toxicity, to make sure that when you put cells into uh, a patient that it's safe. And all of those patients have uh, shown to date that the procedure was safe. So phase one is proceeding along exactly as you would hope. I had the occasion actually to meet patient number six, uh, which was a, a young woman uh, up in Northern California. Uh, and uh, she was uh, uh, remarkable. I mean, she was somebody who uh, fit with, faced with a, a dramatic injury, uh, was uh, tremendously enthusiastic about the, the trials, uh, very hopeful that things were going to, uh, to deliver dramatic results for her and others with a similar sort of uh, condition. And I know that, that she, along with the other six, other five, excuse me, are uh, avidly following this development and hoping that the Geron uh, portfolio will be picked up. Uh, as we sit here today, that, that's sort of a work in progress. Uh, invite everybody along with us to track that and to see where, where things go. Uh, Geron, as you know, uh, was the, the first company in uh, the world to get FDA approval for a human embryonic stem cell derived product. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, wholly apart from the actual work they're doing, uh, performed the, uh, both the spinal cord uh, injury community and the cellular therapy community a considerable service in being the first company to work its way through FDA approval of a human embryonic stem cell derived product. Uh, and that is something that's very important because the FDA is not one to rush into things. They're very conservative. When it comes to new areas of medical treatment, like uh, cellular therapy, they are deliberate and they really require a lot of, uh, of data and discussion uh, and uh, thought. And Geron, five is in, five, five minutes, okay. Uh, Geron uh, worked their way through there and, and, and were, uh, were very successful uh, in getting that approval. So 
We hope that things reinstate. We're, we're very optimistic about that, but we, we will wait to see how things play out. We know that Jaron is weighing that, that offer as we speak. Uh, on other fronts, uh, we've, uh, just to, to give you a, a bit more update on, on CIRM, we've got what we think some projects that are very, uh, very much heading towards what we hope to be a successful conclusion in uh, a number of other conditions. Uh, we've got some great work going on uh, by a team head, uh, headed by USC in the area of macular degeneration, which as you know is the leading cause of blindness for uh, adults over age 65. Uh, we have uh, some very exciting work going on uh, with a company called Viasite down in, uh, in the San Diego area in the area of type 1 diabetes, uh, which is something we uh, just at, at the same time uh, for, I guess, the, the meeting following where we gave Stem Cells Inc. their uh, most recent grant. Uh, we funded Viasite for, I think it was the third time, Oz. Uh, this is a company that's working on a human embryonic stem cell derived product uh, that uh, is, look, is looking to uh, have uh, insul uh, insulin producing islet cells put into a, uh, a, a pa basically a little pouch that's inserted subcutaneously uh, in, uh, in patients that will secrete insulin uh, and, and in so doing we believe will uh, ultimately have a good shot at potentially curing diabetes. Uh, we have uh, some very interesting work going on in the HIV AIDS space uh, that, uh, that uh, takes advantage of, of what was learned. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of uh, somebody called the so-called Berlin patient who is a, a patient who had AIDS and leukemia treated in Berlin with a bone marrow transplant that had, which by the way is stem cell therapy, that's what bone marrow transplant is, uh, was uh, treated uh, with, a, uh, with marrow from a donor from a small population in Scandinavia that has evolved over time to not have the gene that is the receptor site for the HIV virus. And when they did this transplant, which is a normal treatment for uh, leukemia, I guess it was lymphoma, sorry, it was for lymphoma, uh, it not only cured the lymphoma, but that patient has been AIDS-free now for five years, which is remarkable, I've got two minutes now. Uh, uh, one other thing I'll mention, we just funded a very exciting piece of work the area of, uh, of uh, heart attacks, where a company based out of, affiliated rather with Cedar sinai uh, is, has a technology that uh, through uh, the, the use of stem cells uh, not only uh, helps uh, to generate the, uh, uh, the cells that can repopulate the heart after a heart attack to uh, to increase the, the, the good area of the heart. It also uh, is able to, uh, to reduce the scarring uh, that is caused by a heart attack, which is the first time that has ever been shown to happen. That's going into phase two clinical trials. So that is, among other things, uh, these are some very exciting projects we have. Uh, but nothing uh, is, uh, is sort of more central to our thought than, than the spinal cord injury. As you know, Christopher Reeve and Roman Reed, who many of you know, were uh, absolutely tireless advocates in the uh, election that, uh, that gave us the passage of Prop 71. Uh, when we lost Christopher, that was a, a, a devastating blow to everybody. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it, it's not lost on us that we are uh, very much uh, interested in trying to help and to continue the great legacy of the work that he did, the work that Roman Reed is doing, and to uh, ultimately find something that can uh, lead to a cure for spinal cord injury. So with that, I'm given, being giving the zero sign. Uh, and I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, 
be around here. Would, would love to uh, answer any questions you might have. There's an awful lot of exciting stuff going on. Look forward to the rest of the agenda. And thank you all very much for listening. Appreciate the opportunity.